Good morning, my name is Jasmine. I'd like to welcome you to Sanctuary Church Online. Uh, comment in the comments below. Let us know where you're joining us from. We have got a great message ready for you guys. We've got worship ready for you. So uh, get ready and join us in worship. Hey everyone, we're glad to see you this morning. Let's worship our King together. Let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done. I'm 
Boy, do I ever appreciate the work that our worship team does. I know that worship isn't the same experience that many of us are used to and probably many of us would like to have at some point when we can be back together in a room, standing side by side. But I'm really thankful for our worship team and just every week they prepare and lead us in worship. And I hope as you are able to worship along with them, that whether you're sitting on a chair or your couch and you're living or whatever, is that, that the declarations that they lead us in and that you're able to just listen to and be ministered to by or even sing them along or think of them along, they would minister to you as we've sung about the great things that God has done and the freedom that he's brought in our lives, that we are children of God and we're no longer slaves to fear. Those are, those are incredible truths. We had a prayer time earlier this week on Zoom, and as we gathered and before we went into prayer, we just took some time and kind of went around the screens, and people shared things that they're thankful for, some of the good things and the great things that God has done. And it was so encouraging just to hear some of the things. Some were large and some were small, but they were all great. And so, again, even as we've sung that, I pray that you would just reflect on some of the great things that God is doing in the midst of some challenging seasons. And so thanks again for worshiping and joining with us in this setting. Uh, We also, I just want to say thank you as well for your financial partnership in all that Sanctuary Church is doing. Your faithful giving and your generosity is enabling us to really serve beyond ourselves, serve others in our city, help and care for others. And if you're looking for ways to contribute, you can just go to our website, sanctuarychurch.life forward slash give, and all the information will be there. And again, thank you so much for your generosity. We're going to jump into the book of Mark again and continue on in our series. But let me just open in prayer as we say, God, have your way in all of our lives. Help us to learn more about you and fall more deeply in love with your son Jesus through this. Father, thank you that you sent your son Jesus because you love us. And as we spend these next several weeks in the gospel of Mark looking at Jesus, help us to not only learn more about Jesus, but fall more deeply in love with Jesus and experience the transforming power of Jesus' love at work in our lives. So guide us in all we're going to do as we spend these minutes together in this form in your name. Amen. Well, Again, we are continuing our series, Follow Me in the Gospel of Mark, and I want to encourage you to get a Bible out, get whatever it is, and so you can follow along with us. We're going to be looking at a few different passages of Scripture, but we're going to take Mark and then move forward, but we're really just spending several weeks in the Gospel of Mark, but we're spending several weeks looking at Jesus, looking at Jesus and his power over the powers that would oppress and suppress us, his love for us, his instructions to us, his encouragement and his invitation to follow him of all the ways that I would know myself and we would be known is simply the beauty and the simplicity of a follower of Jesus there's so many labels that we can wear we talked about this last week that that would be the label that we just say you know with with pride if you will with confidence I'm a follower of Jesus and we're just journeying together and so today we're going to look at Mark's first account of Jesus when Jesus first arrives on the scene and he gets baptized by John the Baptist. 
And in this account, we're going to hear God make a statement or a declaration about Jesus that probably many of us are somewhat familiar with. But I know as I have looked at this and prayed about this and studied this, I had far too narrow a target for this statement. I didn't realize how far reaching it was, how good a statement it really is. So it's in Mark chapter 1, verses 9 to 11, when Jesus arrives on the scene. It says this. One day, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee, and John baptized him in the Jordan River. As Jesus came up out of the water, he saw the heavens splitting apart and the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice from heaven said, you are my dearly loved son, and you bring me great joy. Jesus arrives on the scene, and right at the beginning, before he's done anything, God says to him, you belong to me. I accept you. I love you. And you fill me with joy. Can you just imagine with me for a minute someone coming up to you and God coming to you and saying that, kind of looking you in the eye and saying, I love you. I accept you. You bring me immense joy. It'd be a pretty powerful statement that someone would make towards you, and it'd probably have a fairly profound impact on how you'd feel in that moment. You'd feel safe. You'd feel secure. You'd feel loved. You'd feel almost like you were in your own little sanctuary, so to speak. And we've talked about this before as we talk about sanctuary church, that we really don't want sanctuary church to be known first and foremost as a place that you go to. It, it certainly isn't a place that you go to at this point, but that it would be a people who live in community together and are leaning into Jesus together, but that it would also be this position that we would live from in the safety and the sanctuary of God's transforming love in our lives. Why did God make this statement, though? Why did God make this declaration to Jesus right at the beginning? Was it for Jesus' sake? Well, maybe, and probably certainly a part of it was for Jesus' sake. It would have been affirming and encouraging to him as he was about to begin his ministry. But in the Gospel of Matthew, Matthew records this same declaration, and he, said, and he records God saying, this is my son in whom I'm well pleased. So that statement or that declaration that God makes, it was for Jesus and it would have been encouraging and affirming for him. But it was for the audience, for those hearing this statement, for those hearing it then and for us hearing it now. See, right at the beginning as Jesus is just about to get started, because remember at this point, all anybody knew was that Jesus was Mary and Joseph's son, the son of a carpenter, probably a carpenter himself. And this declaration from God about Jesus would change the way that people looked at and thought about Jesus. No longer would they look at him simply from a human perspective. And just a little bit later in Mark, and we'll get there a few weeks down the road, we'll see that people were still struggling. Some people were still struggling with seeing Jesus from that human perspective. He's just Mary and Martha's son. He's just a son of a carpenter. And as they were stuck in that human perspective, they missed out on some of the good things that Jesus wanted to bring in their lives. So that statement changes the way we would look at Jesus. So this declaration would have helped them and us see Jesus and how we'd respond to him. But this declaration also shows us God's posture towards Jesus. It shows him God, it shows us, sorry, God's posture of love and pleasure. It shows us right off the bat that God is not a performance-oriented God, a God who would look at me, look at you, look at Jesus and say, what have you done for me lately? Jesus hadn't done anything to this point. He just kind of arrived on the scene. And before he had done anything, God declares to him his love for him and his pleasure towards him. And as we begin to discover more of God's heart and posture, just that alone hopefully will free us from striving from feeling like we have to perform to measure up, that we have to try to win God's love and approval by our actions or performance. 
No, God says to Jesus, and he would, that's his heart towards us, before you've done anything, you just need to know, I love you, and you fill my heart with joy. So this declaration is for Jesus, and it's for the audience then and now hearing it. It helps us understand God's heart and its posture. But I believe as we'll look at some scripture passages this morning, we'll see that God not only makes this declaration about Jesus, but he makes it to all of us. And in the same way that that declaration would affirm Jesus' place of belonging and pleasure to God, the Bible shows us that that is God's heart for all of us. See, God says to Jesus, you are my son, you are my child. So who are God's children? I know my understanding of this has shifted over the years as I've looked at scripture more closely. I used to think that everyone had the potential to be God's child, but not everybody was. It was God's heart that everyone would be his child, but not everyone was. Some were in and some were out. Some, were, some belonged and some didn't. And the ones that were in had to make sure that they behaved properly so that they would stay in. And the ones who were in had to make sure that those who were out knew they were out, and maybe if we could somehow scare them with some Thief in the Night movie or the Fires of Hell, we could convince them to be in. And this whole in and out us and them, who are the children of God and who aren't the children of God, it creates a paradigm that we view ourselves and others with that simply enhances or magnifies judgment, evaluation, uh, division between people. Even among those who are supposedly in, we begin to look at others who are in and wondering, hey, is that really appropriate behavior for someone who is in? Should they be doing that? And all of those kinds of judgments and criteria just aren't, are, aren't the best for us. See, the Bible shows us clearly that God makes this same statement over all of us, over everyone, over anyone, as he calls us all his own. And as we understand this statement and the enormity of its scope and its reach, it dismantles the whole in and out, us and them paradigm that we would have, which can significantly affect the way we see ourselves and our posture towards others. See, sometimes we can have this whole, you need to believe, and then eventually you will behave, and then at some point, if you believe strongly enough and behave well enough, then you can belong. We're kind of working our way towards a place of belonging. But that's not it at all. Our whole journey with Jesus begins from the place of belonging and living from that place and discovering the fullness of that. We're living in a time when questions of belonging and acceptance, issues of identity are at an all-time high, and they present people with massive challenges. They can show up on one end as maybe just mild insecurities and challenges with self-esteem, all the way to the other end where people don't even feel like they belong or are accepted in their own bodies. They're not sure of their identity, and the that uncertainty about belonging and acceptance and identity presents a whole host of challenges. And the turmoil and the pain that these questions of belonging and identity and acceptance can produce in people bring feelings of despair, of being unsafe, even suicidal. And unfortunately, Sometimes, when people see others struggling with these issues, we respond to these questions as positions to be defended or enforced, instead of people to be shown empathy and compassion and loved. So let's look together at some passages of Scripture that speak to these foundational issues of belonging, acceptance, and that would help us more clearly see that that same declaration that God makes to Jesus, you're my child, you belong, I love you, and you fill my heart with joy. He makes 
to all of us. Let's look first together. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 14 to 17. The Apostle Paul is writing, he says this, either way, Christ's love controls us or compels us. Since we believe that Christ died for all, we also believe that we have all died. He died for everyone so that those who receive his new life will no longer live for themselves. Instead, they will live for Christ who died and was raised for them. So we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. At one point, we thought of Christ merely from a human point of view. He's just Mary and Joseph's son, the son of a carpenter. How differently we know him now. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. And all of this is a gift from God. There's no performance oriented, no striving, no working for. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us this task of reconciling people to him. Now catch this. For God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. He says, you're all mine. No longer counting people's sins against them. And he gave us, followers of Jesus, this wonderful message of reconciliation. Paul tells us that on the cross, Jesus died for all and that somehow all have died and that God through Jesus reconciled the world, the entire world to himself and he is no longer counting people's sins against them. God is not holding people's sins against them and he's reconciled everyone. When he says the world, that, that means everybody. That's, it says, you're all mine now. Through the work that Jesus did on the cross, you're all mine. You're all my kids. I love you. You belong. You fill my heart with great joy. And that's the message of reconciliation that we as followers of Jesus have been given to tell the world. That's, that's what evangelism looks like. That's good news. Not to tell people about, hey, you're out. Hopefully someday you could get in. Or if you behave and believe enough that maybe someday you can belong. No, the good news, this wonderful message of reconciliation is you belong. You love. You're in. Paul goes on to reaffirm this. He just kind of presses the point even farther in Colossians chapter 2 where he says this, you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ for he forgave all our sins. He canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. Again, we see God is not holding anyone's sin against us. The charges against us have been dealt with and the powers of this world that would seek to oppress us and kind of hold us in fear, in shame, in condemnation, in insecurity of do we belong, are we accepted, are we in, are we out, they have all been disarmed and canceled on the cross. Paul again, Romans 5, says the same thing. Romans 5, verses 12 and 15 says, When Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death, so death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. But there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. For the sin of this one man, Adam, brought death to many. But even greater is God's wonderful grace and his gift of forgiveness to many through this other man, Jesus Christ. That what Paul is saying is, through one man, Adam, sin came to all. But how much greater is God's gracious gift of forgiveness that through one man, Jesus Christ, forgiveness was provided for all. That's what's being contrasted there. Not, not for some, not for those who are in, not for those who might belong. He says, for all. Everyone is in. God's, that's, what's, that's the message 
of the gospel. That's the message that God declares over me and over you. Everyone is in. You are all my children, God says. I'm not holding any sin against you. Now, maybe that sounds too good to be true. Maybe even as you're hearing that, you're like, well, that, that sounds a little scary. Are, are you saying that everybody's saved? That everybody's gonna get saved? No, that, that's not what we're saying. Because God, in his love for us, has given us all free will. And we all freely have the choice to accept what he has accomplished for us. But we accept it from the position of being in. The default is we are in, not that we are out. Everything has changed for everyone. God has nothing against us, and he claims the world, everyone, me, you, all of us, as his own. That begins to be, or that needs to be, the default that we live from. The default is that we belong. The default is that we are accepted. The default is that we are loved. The default is that we are on the inside. Now, we need to accept our acceptance and grow in the fullness of that and help others learn about that, but it all starts from this place of belonging. Our journey with Jesus in growing in our understanding of who he is, his love for us, and inviting the transforming power of his love into our life starts from this place of being in, being accepted, being belonging, being his children. The same declaration that God makes over Jesus at the, right at the beginning, before he's done anything, you are my dearly loved child and you fill my heart with joy he makes over you, that you would hear that today, that I would hear that today. Now, again, we just don't have to look any farther than sometimes the mirror or others around us to know that not everybody knows this. Not everybody believes this. Not everybody accepts this. And some won't accept it for a variety of different reasons. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 that the God or the ruler of this world has blinded people's minds to how good this news really is. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4 says this, Satan, who is the God of this world, has blinded the minds of those who don't believe. They're unable to see the glorious light of the good news. They don't understand this message about Jesus, who is the exact likeness of God. See, it is really good news. Remember last week, that's how Mark started his gospel. Let me tell you the good news about Jesus. And it is really good news. There's a saying that probably we will all, you'll know, it says, if it's too good to be true, it, it probably isn't. And we kind of, it's that sense that you kind of live with a little bit of skepticism, live with a little bit of cynicism. We would call it wisdom or common sense. You know, fool me once, shame on me, fool me twice, uh, shame on you, fool me twice, shame on me. That sense of, ah, it just sounds too good to be true. But the reality with the gospel is, if it sounds too good to be true, we're getting closer to the truth because it's that good. It's that powerful. It's that amazing. And the God of this world, Satan, the powers of this world have blinded people's minds to that. Some just, again, for lots of different reasons, don't know it, can't accept it, don't feel like they're able to do it. But those of us as followers of Jesus, that's the amazing journey that we're on growing in our understanding of it, growing in our discovery of the fullness of it and what it does in our lives and helping others know, helping others know, hey, it's this good. It sounds too good to be true, but it's true. It's this good. And while others may not know this about themselves, what this also changes though is we know this about them. Even if they don't know it about themselves, even if they won't accept it about themselves, even if they present a variety of reasons to reject it about themselves, which is everybody's free to make those choices, but what it does for us is we know this about them. 
And so like Paul said way back in 2 Corinthians 5, 16, because of this, we have stopped evaluating others from a human point of view. Because of this, because of what Jesus accomplished on the cross, because of this declaration that God makes over all of us, you're all my kids, you're all in, you all belong, I love you all, and you fill my heart with joy. Because of this, it changes, even if someone else doesn't know that or believe it or accept it, it changes how I see them because I know that of them. And so that's how I need to relate to them. So any labels of division, any labels of categorization, you're this, you're that, all the labels that we might put on ourselves, on others, they just need to fall away. Because all those labels, whatever they may be, are labels from a human point of view. And what God says is because of what Jesus did, you who are my followers, now we've stopped evaluating people from a human point of view. So we need to just drop all the labels. They're this, she's that, he's that, I'm this. No, 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 we're followers of Jesus. We're his dearly loved kids and we fill his heart with great joy. That declaration that God made over Jesus when he came up out of the water in Mark 1, 11, that changed the way that people saw Jesus. He's no longer just Mary and Joseph's son. He's no longer just the son of a carpenter. He's no longer just a carpenter himself. He is a child of God and God is pleased with him. It now changes the way we see ourselves and we see the world around us. So we need to, we get to treat everyone like an insider. Everyone's an insider. Nobody's an outsider because that's how God treats people. I continue to grow in my understanding of that as a dad. I've got four kids now, three through uh, birth, one through marriage, and it's amazing. And there is nothing that my kids could ever do that would say, you're out. You don't belong. No, 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 no. I look at them and, and the moment they came into our lives, before they had done anything, you just think, oh my gosh, you fill my heart with so much joy. You fill my heart with so much pleasure. They hadn't played a lick of music. They hadn't answered any math questions really well. They hadn't shown any artistic abilities. They'd done nothing. But as a human father, imperfect as I am, you looked at your child as they arrive on your doorstep and think, you're mine. You belong to me. I accept you completely and you fill my heart with absolute pleasure. And there's nothing that will ever change that. That doesn't mean as our kids grow up that every decision and choice they make, I'm happy with. Doesn't mean everyone I would agree with. Doesn't mean I would have done the exact same thing. There are times I think, oh, okay, it's your choice to make. I would have done it differently. Are, are you sure you want to go down that path? There are times that sometimes as a parent, you can be really concerned and anxious and even grieved a little bit at some of the choices they would make because you think, oh, I just don't know that this is going to be the best for you. But regardless of the emotions that some of the choices and decisions that they may or may not make, nothing would even begin to bring a shadow to that position of, they're my kids, and I am so incredibly proud of them, and I will always be proud of them, and they will always fill my heart with joy. And if I, as an imperfect father, can understand that, just for a moment think what our perfect heavenly father does. He gets it with perfection. I'm human, I've, I've blown it, I've made mistakes, there's all kinds of things that I'm growing in and learning in. But our father in heaven, he never gets it wrong. And if I can understand and we can understand that, though they're my kids, they're never gonna stop being my kids. And, and they're fully my kids from day one. They don't work their way up to being my kids. If I can relate to my kids that way, how much more will our perfect heavenly father relate to us? Jesus teaches us about this same idea, this same posture of our father in heaven in the story of the prodigal son. Jesus tells this story about a son, and he was a son. 
he belonged to his father. He was loved, he was accepted, but he rejected it. He didn't want it. He kind of, and he had the free will to make that choice just as we all do. And the son said, I'm done, I'm out, that's it. And he behaved in a manner completely contrary to the way the father wanted him to behave. He made choices that grieved the heart of his father. And at some point, he begins to realize, you know what, I don't know that I can be a son anymore. I don't know that I can belong from that perspective anymore. Maybe I can just work for him. At least then I can have more resources and a little more comfortable setting than I have now. And he begins to make his way home. And Jesus, as he's telling this story that is to reveal really the heart of the father to all of us, tells us of the story, how does the father respond? The father responds by modeling with incredible beauty. You're in. Even when you didn't want to be, you're in. Even when you didn't know you were, you're in. And the father runs to him, loves him, demonstrates the joy and the pleasure that his, his son brings to him. He says, hey, let's throw a party. He doesn't demonstrate that his heart is sorrowful or grieved or angry or perturbed or mistrustful. He says, ah, let me show you how much pleasure you fill my heart with. Let's have a party. Fill, you know, kill the fatted calf. And he begins to celebrate. He protects him from the judgment of others who would seek to say, hey, you're on the outside. Hey, you don't belong because you didn't behave a certain way. He, he gets in front of all of that and he models to his son and to anybody else, hey, you belong. You've always been on the inside. You've always belonged. You've always been accepted and you've always filled my heart with great joy and pleasure. And he welcomes him in right again to his rightful place in the family. There was no, well, maybe, well, let's give it a trial run. We're not so sure. No, no. He welcomes him right in. There's another incident in the life of Jesus where he expresses this, the story of a woman caught in adultery. And the law of that day said that if a woman was caught in adultery, she needed to be punished. And the punishment was death. And so people bring her to him and said, Jesus, she was caught in the act of adultery. She's obviously not behaving appropriately. She obviously doesn't belong. She is obviously out, not in, them, not us. What are you going to do? And Jesus protects her from the accusations and the shame and the condemnation of others. Jesus gives her dignity and value as he talks with her with compassion and empathy. And he says to her, I don't condemn you. I don't accuse you. You're not on the outside. You're on the inside. Now go and sin no more. What precedes the change in her life? What precedes that journey of being transformed by the love of Jesus? It was her sense of knowing that she's accepted. She's loved. It, it wasn't go and sin no more, then I'll accept you. Go and sin no more, then I won't condemn you. It was like, I don't condemn you. I don't accuse you. You're in. You belong. You're accepted. You fill my heart with joy. Now go and sin no more. This journey of being transformed by the love of Jesus begins from the sanctuary, the safety of knowing we belong and we are loved. It's love that transforms our lives. The work that Jesus wants to do in all of our lives, in my life and in your life, it starts from the place of belonging. And from that place of belonging, from knowing we are accepted, then we become in the safety of his love. First John 4, 18 tells this about God. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. To a mind that has been blinded by the God of this world, to all of our minds that have been blinded and influenced by the God of this world, Satan, there can be an extreme fear and anxiety to hand over parts of our lives. As we think, uh, can I trust you with the financial part of my life? Can I trust you with the relational part of my life? Can I trust you with the career part of my life? All these different pieces and parts of our lives, there can be some real fear saying, are, are you sure you've got my best interest at heart? 
are you sure I can trust you? And, and that's natural because we live in this world and the God of this world has blinded us to God's love and said, you know what, I don't know that you can trust God. You know what, I think you are gonna do a better job with that piece of your life and that piece of your life and that piece of your life than God will ever do. He will wreck it, he'll ruin it. But as we know, you know what? You're my child. You're my dearly loved child. I accept you. You belong to me. You fill my heart with great joy. And from that place of love, all of a sudden that fear begins to be displaced. Not all of it immediately. We're well conditioned by the fear of this world. But over time, bit by bit, it gets displaced. And all of a sudden, you know what? I can trust him with this part of my life. And I can trust him with this part of my life. And I can trust him with this part of my life. From the place of belonging, of knowing we are loved, and having fear dispelled from our lives, we begin the journey of becoming. Like the song we sang just a few minutes ago, I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child of God. That's not a song that some of us get to sing and others don't get to sing. Everybody could sing it. Now, not everybody does because not everybody is aware of it, but we're aware of it. And because we're a child of God, because we belong, we're no longer slaves to fear. We're not held in condemnation, shame. We're not on the outside. The default is we're on the inside. Let me just give you a couple questions to consider. They're a little more reflective questions as we just think about some of these declarations that God makes and how they would kind of shape the interior of our lives or maybe influence us. The first one is just, I really just kind of, that you would imagine with me for a minute, God coming to you and looking you directly in the eye and saying to you, you are my dearly loved child. You belong to me, I accept you, and you fill my heart with great joy. And just sit in that for a moment and just now reflect on how does that make you feel? How does that, and again, maybe it's a little awkward seeing God come to you and look you in the eye, but just how does that statement make you feel? Because it should make us feel a certain way. It should make us feel more peaceful, more hopeful, more accepted, more secure, less fearful less anxious, more able to say, let's go on this journey together. Second question, how does knowing that God is not holding your sin against you make you feel? Sometimes we can be our own worst enemies and beat ourselves up by the mistakes that we've made years ago, maybe a moment ago. And we can find ourselves living with all kinds of shame and condemnation and what if anybody found out and what if anybody knew and and again, all that striving, whatnot. But just know, you know what? God says, I'm not holding your sin against you. It's done. I've canceled the debt against you. It's been disarmed. All the powers that would seek to hold you in condemnation, shame and all that, that's disarmed. Think about that just for a minute. How does that make you feel? And then finally, imagine with me again Someone that you might have previously considered to be on the outside. I don't don't know what that picture would be for you, but maybe someone before this message today, you would have thought, they're definitely on the outside. The way they behave, they don't belong. I hope someday they could belong, but they don't belong today. They are definitely them, not us. They're definitely out, not in. So just imagine that person or that kind of group of people right now. And as you're imagining them, just see God coming to them and making that same declaration over them. You are my dearly loved child, and you fill my heart with great joy. And as we see and hear God making that declaration over them, just again reflect on how does that influence how we would think about or respond to them, knowing that they're in and they belong. Again, way back to Mark chapter 1, verse 11. It's an incredibly powerful statement that God makes over Jesus right at the beginning of this whole thing. It would have been encouraging and affirming for Jesus. It would have changed the way the audience around hearing it then and those of us hearing it today would have seen Jesus no longer seeing him or evaluating him from a human viewpoint. But the reach and the scope of that statement, though it was about Jesus, it's bigger than Jesus. It's to you, it's to me, it's to all of us. Hey, I want to close in prayer. And I pray that we would just rest well in the sanctuary of God's love for us and allow it to continue to transform us. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you that you speak and you say to us as a perfect, loving Father, you are my dearly loved son, you're my dearly loved daughter, and you fill my heart with great joy. Lord, help me to grow in my understanding of that. Help me to grow in my understanding of that your love for me that just continues to push fear out of my life, continues to push striving and being more performance oriented away from me and help those hearing this message today to grow the same way and help us to no longer view ourselves from a human point of view and also view others. Help us to see those who may not yet know they're on the inside that we would know they're in and to share that incredible message, the good news that they're in, that they would accept their acceptance and allow your love to transform them. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, thanks again for joining us. Look forward to this journey through the Gospel of Mark as we turn to Jesus and learn more about him. Have a great rest of the day and let's make sure we live in the love of Jesus and share the love of Jesus with those around us. Take care. God bless. Hey guys, let's all worship God together. Worship our King. Come, let us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. See us done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great. You conquered the grave, you free every captive and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awaken alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things, yeah. Come on, let's sing hallelujah, God above it all. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hallelujah, you have done great things. You've done great things. Yeah. Hallelujah, God, above it all. Hallelujah, God, unshakable. Hey, it's Jazz. I just wanted to unpack one of the questions with you. Uh, the question that really resonated with me was question number one. Um, imagine God coming to you, looking at you and saying, you are my dearly beloved child um, and you bring me great joy. How does that make me feel? And I think when I first read this, it's just the thought of, oh my goodness, like he loves me so much. And when you think, you know, think back on your life, it's so easy to think of all the reasons that you'd be disqualified from this love. Um, but we're not. He looks at us and he says, you're worthy. And I remember um, the first time I read Zephaniah 317, it says um, he sings over us. And I just thought, wow, like not only do you love me, but you actually make that effort to sing over me. Um, his love just blows my mind. And I think that that's something that he's really saying over us like right now and to you right now is that you are worthy and that he loves you. And, you know, even though you may feel like you've done nothing to earn that love because you haven't, um, it's just who he is and it's just the door he opened through Jesus because, um, you know, Jesus loves us. Um, so 
Yeah, the question number one really resonated with me. I hope you're uh, really challenged by these questions this week. Um, so thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next week.